Hi, I'm Judy Pizzo. I'm Planning Project Manager with the Florida Department of Transportation District 5 and the Project Manager for the Central Florida Transportation Planning Group. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. On behalf of the Florida DOT, I would like to welcome you to our virtual Central Florida Transportation Planning Group. And I also want to thank the Florida LTAP Center for offering to host this virtual meeting and making it accessible to statewide audience. And from that last slide, I can see that we're also Raleigh, North Carolina and Texas and a couple other places I didn't quite catch. Good to see you folks. These meetings have been hosted quarterly by District 5 since 2007 and provide a forum for transportation and planning professionals to stay updated about local transportation initiatives, trends and hot topics while receiving professional development credits. The CFTPG is supported by a board of advisors represented by the Florida DOT and Turnpike staff, local governments, industry professionals, and University of Central Florida engineering and planning department representatives. I want to thank them for their time and support in assisting us with topic selections and recruitment of speakers. You can find out more about the Central Florida Transportation Planning Group, recent past presentations, and our board members on the Florida Department's Forecasting and Trends website, the Sudamus Online, that's F-S-U-T-M-S Online, under the tab M-T-F forward slash users groups. I would also like to thank today's distinguished panelists for taking time from their busy schedule to join us. I'm looking forward to hearing their presentations and the panel discussions. The Space Coast has always been a hot topic of interest from past audience surveys, and we could not ask for a better representation than this panel. As we come to the end of 2020, there is one more CFTPG meeting planned for December. If you are already on our email database, you will receive information and an invite on that. If not, you would and would like to be added, please take the time to complete the feedback survey at the end of the webinar to let us know how we did on this session and recommend topics you're interested in for future sessions. These feedback surveys help us to provide the topics most important to you. So tell us what you would like to see for 2021. I would also like to bring to everyone's attention that tomorrow kicks off the third annual statewide mobility week. This is a statewide celebration of smart, efficient, and safe transportation choices. During the week of October 30th through November 6th, local government, transit agencies, and transportation organizations will be hosting live and virtual events to promote sustainable transportation. Also, if you like to ride a bike for commuting or recreation, or even ride an indoor bike, Join the month-long Love to Ride Florida Bicycle Challenge and win great prizes. To find out the schedule of events or the Bicycle Challenge, visit www.mobilityweekfl.com. Again, that's mobilityweekfl.com. So with us today is someone I've known for over 10 years, Allison McCuddy. She is our freight and logistics manager at Florida DOT District 5. I've asked Allison to make some remarks at this session as she works very closely with Space Florida, the Melbourne International Airport, Port Canaveral, and the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization on several initiatives crucial to the success of this region. In Allison's current role, she oversees great grant, excuse me, creation distribution, compliance and completion for the aviation seaport and spaceport program, as well as the planning, development, and analysis of freight and goods movement and intermodal project programs that relate to freight. Allison has been with the department for over 10 years, as I said, and predominantly has worked with airports and seaports. Allison will discuss the department's partnership with Port Canaveral, Space Florida, and Melbourne International Airport. She is a graduate from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Prior to coming to District 5, she worked with the Lee County Port Authority in Fort Myers for the Southwest Florida International and Page Field Airports. Outside of work, she enjoys staying, keeping busy, keeping up with her kids, and enjoying surfing and chasing birds. So good afternoon. Good morning, Allison. It's great to see you. 
Oh, mute. All right. Good morning, Judy and everyone. Thank you, Judy, for such a great introduction. Um, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because the, the lineup of panelists we have, I'm greatly looking forward to um, hearing what they have to say. We have such a great partnership. Um, I'm so fortunate and thankful to be able to work with these individuals and their sponsors on a regular basis in order to make District 5 and the Space Coast such a great place to live and play and work. Um, I'd like to introduce Georgiana Gillette, today's panelist moderator. She is the Executive Director of Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization. Georgiana has 26 years of experience with the transportation field. She started her career in 1999 with FDOT in consultant project management. She began her career at the Space Coast CPO in 2010 and has served as the executive director since 2018. Georgiana will discuss the TPO's long range vision and her initiatives to work with spaceport, airport, and seaport, and will moderate the panel discussion focusing on the transportation and economic impacts of the industries. With that, I'd like to welcome Georgiana to facilitate the remainder of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. It is really a pleasure uh, to moderate this meeting today. I'm excited to hear from three of our major modal agencies here in Brevard County. Um, the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization helps the Central Florida region create a vision for transportation 25 years into the future. Our governing board and committee meetings provide a regional forum for elected officials, transportation authorities, industry leaders, and citizens to have candid conversations about transportation challenges and priorities in Brevard County, our planning area. We recently adopted our 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan, and our commitment is to provide strategic transportation investments that will improve safety for all users, improve economic development with a connected multimodal system, enhance mobility and reliability, and provide a resilient transportation system. What makes the Space Coast unique is the diverse transportation modes. Through our visioning exercise, we asked our com uh, communities, who do we want to be? And the answer was a continued investment in port centers, space, sea, and air. Continue the high tech focus with a consideration and impact of future technological advances in transportation from how we travel to more travel options. We want to connect where we live to where we work and play with less reliance on automobiles while preserving our natural environment. The Space Coast is home to several internationally recognized facilities, John F. Kennedy Space Center and the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, collectively known as the Cape Canaveral Spaceport, and the Canaveral Port Authority. The Orlando Melbourne International Airport is an epicenter of aviation and aerospace with seven of the top defense contractor companies located at or adjacent to its campus. Brevard County is becoming the 21st century community with 21st century companies, making the Brevard County planning area more competitive in the local, regional, and global economies is key to creating jobs. A robust economy leads to stronger communities. Our robust transportation system is largely driven by the activities supporting the Cape Canaveral Spaceport, Port Canaveral, and Orlando Melbourne International Airport. These strategic intermodal system hubs and the transportation corridors that support them are considered the backbone of Florida's transportation system and account for a dominant share of the people and freight movement. They connect Central Florida's economy to the world and beyond. One of the critical corridors include the newly constructed I-95 interchange at Ellis Road and the future widening of Ellis to the Orlando Melbourne International Airport. Other critical infrastructure includes the future State Road 528 or the beach line widening, as well as the State Road 401 bascule bridge replacements at Port Canaveral. Uh, 
on the spaceport, the Indian River Bridge replacement, NASA Causeway and Space Commerce Way widening was recently awarded an infrastructure grant to ensure freight mobility and workforce access at the Cape's intermodal spaceport. The challenges of meeting the needs of our shared transportation system require bold solutions. And we realize that if we stand still as an organization, while the transportation industry moves forward, we'll be left behind. So we will adapt as needed to achieve our region's goals over the next two decades of transformation. So we will continue to collaborate with our industry partners to plan among the different modes of transportation to ensure that all future needs are considered when planning for the future. So I think now we are ready for uh, a couple poll questions at this point. Kristen? Yeah, absolutely. Let me just share my screen here. All right. All right. So which sector of space launch is expected to grow the fastest over the next 10 years? So again, this is using menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and the code is there at the top of the screen, which is 15513288. Excellent. All right. Uh, there's a few more coming in. Overwhelmingly, I think most folks think uh, the private and commercial, uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, and that answer is correct. Uh, the private space industry is booming and uh, in more ways than one. So that is very, very exciting. Okay, moving on to the next question. How many modes of transportation are associated with a Cape Canaveral spaceport? Very good. So the answer is five. Uh, the Cape Canaveral spaceport is quintimodal. Uh, you have air, you have sea, you've got highways, you have rail, and you have space. Yes, space is a mode of transportation. So uh, overwhelmingly, over a little over half of, of the folks got that answer correct. So very good. Next question. How many launches have taken place so far in 2020, and how many are scheduled before the end of the year? All right. Yeah, this is a difficult one. Uh, yes, uh, most folks got the correct answer. 24 launches have taken place so far in 2020 and 11 are scheduled for the remainder of the year. Wow, that's exciting. Very good. All right, so at this time, I'd like to introduce our first panelist and industry leader. Mark Bontrager serves as Vice President for Spaceport Operations. In this role, Mark leads the planning and development of space transportation infrastructure improvement projects of Space Florida's Spaceport Holdings and the Florida Spaceport System Plan. Mark is responsible for the development and operations of Space Florida's spaceport assets, including multiple launch complexes, launch vehicle processing facilities, storage facilities, and payload, payload processing facilities. He also oversees the implementation of the Cape Canaveral Spaceport Master Plan and the Spaceport Improvement Program, enabling more than $1 billion in infrastructure investments and in planning and engineering support. Mark works closely with multiple aerospace companies, including Blue Origin, SpaceX, and United Launch Alliance, as well as FDOT, NASA, and the US Space Force to capture opportunities to improve and modernize Florida's existing spaceport assets. He has more than 21 years of experience with the United States Air Force. 
Mark holds a Bachelor of Science in Com Computer Engineering from the University of Florida, a Master's of Engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder, a Master's in National Security Studies from the Naval War College, and a Master's in Air Power Art and Science from the School of Advanced Air Power Studies at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Georgiana. I appreciate it. You know, this audience is so smart on all the space stuff. I don't know if I even need to give this briefing, but thank you for the opportunity um, to share with you all kind of what we're seeing happen here in Florida. And frankly, it's because our state has taken such an aggressive role and helping enable this transition that we are all watching happen. The last 50 years, leaping off the surface of the Earth was really a, a federal government thing, from the NASA uh, exploration domain and certainly the Department of Defense for national security purposes. And what we're had the privilege of seeing here in Florida is a significant growth in the commercial sector. And so I look forward to sharing you with you guru planners out there, kind of what we're seeing um, as we start to face the future and how we as Florida are doing what we can to help enable that future to happen here for the benefit of all Floridians. Now, a lot of us don't realize how important space is for us in our daily lives. We use it for communications. Uh, we use it for a weather, absolutely critical. Many of us use GPS every day. Remote sensing is a very powerful capability for things like crop readiness and things like that. The sun plays a significant role in our lives and weather and all kinds of other things. And as we are all intrigued with exploration, space is kind of foundational to surface on the planet, for lack of a better term. A lot of times we just take it for granted. We don't realize how important it is in our daily lives. Not only that, space is a significant market. Uh, over $420 billion of global space activity, the bulk of which is really commercial type of growth. There's an insatiable demand for bandwidth. We're seeing all kinds of new entrants get into this domain. And it's really a tremendous and exciting time to be alive in this, in this mode of transportation. And frankly, commercial sector is starting to drive it. This, this chart simply gives an illustration of what we're seeing SpaceX do right now with a global network of over 4,000 satellites providing global broadband. Another company called Airbus OneWeb, who's building satellites in Florida, also 850 satellites will be their network. Uh, you've got Amazon and others looking at their constellations. Right now, roughly 50% of the world does not have access to the internet. And so there's tremendous market opportunity and companies are looking, at how do we make that happen? And it's, that's where a lot of the growth is we're going to see happen in the space domain. The challenge for us in Florida is we're not alone in this business. Theoretically, you can leap off the surface of the earth from anywhere on the surface of the earth. And while we in the United States think human life is very important and so we launch over the oceans, other countries, you know, if you have a bad day with a rocket and it falls on people, you know, it's what a bummer. Uh, and so we have other countries that do not have sea-based uh, launch sites. And so they are launching from inland. And uh, someday I think say, space will become as safe as air. It's not there yet. Uh, but we are in competition as a Florida against a global access to that market. And so we're doing everything we can to make this the best place in the world to do that business. Our nations recognize this. And I just wanna highlight a couple of things at the policy level. Um, a few years back, with the recognition of space and its important, importance, they reestablished the National Space Council. It had not been in place for about 15 years. And so bringing that back online really started to organize within the federal government, the federal agencies, uh, streamlining and revitalization. The administration stressed the clarification of NASA's mission, going to the moon and then to Mars. They set in place the Department of Commerce as the lead for space commerce. Think about it. You're going to be doing transactions on orbit. Well, we we transactions on Earth within the United States. The Department of Commerce does that. How are we going to govern that kind of interaction on orbit? And that's why the space commerce has, has been designated the lead for that effort. And then we established the Space Force here back in December of 2019, a significant step to acknowledge that this domain, the space world, is important to America. And as a result, we need to prepare, be prepared to defend it for the benefit of America. Fascinating things to watch play out 
over the last few years. What we're seeing, as we kind of highlighted earlier, is commercial companies are driving this market growth from SpaceX to Blue Origin to United Launch Alliance to Firefly small rockets. The commercial domain is seeking to compete aggressively in this world. It's kind of a fun snapshot to look back to 2016. We had four active launch pads. You look at it now and you have a significant growth. And this is an Air Force slide from 2016. That's what they saw coming, much of what's already happened. Now, if you actually get to real tactical for a second, this is kind of a fun slide. We've seen 29 launches in the United States so far this year. Two from Virginia, Antares missions, and a Minotaur from Virginia as well. There's a Virgin Orbit flight over to California that was a failure, and an ABL flight out of Alaska that was also a failure. So 29 rockets have lifted off the surface of the Earth from the United States this year. 24 of them came from the Cape. We've had 20 successful SpaceX launches so far this year, and 15 successful landings. You know, that's a real game changer in this domain. We, uh, you know, I grew up in the rocket business, launching Delta IIs back in the day, putting GPS satellites on orbit, and every rocket we launched, we threw away. And Elon Musk came on board, gave enough young engineers enough time and money to say, go figure out how to reuse these things. And we are now seeing rockets come back and land. And if you have not had the opportunity to come over to this, the coast and watch a rocket land on the Cape, it is a fantastic experience. The triple sonic boom is deafening and just adds a quite an exciting thing to see a rocket falling from the sky and touch down safely on land. Now, most of SpaceX landings have happened on their drone ships at sea, but it's a game changer in the business. We see seven more launches scheduled between now and the end, end of the year, seven to 11, actually. I think the number is more accurately, 11. Um, the launch activity is increasing, and we got 40 launches scheduled over the next 12 months. I believe, and we say publicly, we're going to see a time frame where there'll be 100 to 200 launches a year going from the Cape Canaveral spaceport. If we as Florida continue to uh, do the right things to create the right environment for this industry to grow here. Um, some big exciting ones, SpaceX is going to be launching a Crew Dragon in the middle of November, and then in late January, Boeing is going to be doing their second flight test for their Starliner capsule, which soon thereafter will carry humans to the space station, and we'll have two U.S. commercial companies delivering astronauts from U.S. soil back to the space station. Ever since the shuttle flew up in 2011, we have been paying the Russians to launch our astronauts to the space station. And it's great to see this, this happening again here in Florida. And you just can't pass up a graphic that is, this is not a, um, an animation. This is a real video of a rocket coming down and touching down on the Cape. It's a game changer for both the business case of the industry as well as the engineering associated with it. And it's done very, very safely. As you can imagine, your Air Force and your FAA uh, take very seriously the importance of safety. And uh, to be able to allow this to happen safely is really a testament to not only the commercial uh, creativity in the, um, in the innovation brain, it's a testament to uh, the regulatory systems that allow it to happen. So where does Space Florida play a role in this? What's our job here in, in helping enable this to happen in Florida? Just to give you a, just a quick tutorial, Space Florida is an independent special district of the state established in Florida law. We're both a public corporation and independent special district. And we have two kind of functions we play. One is a spaceport authority, not unlike an airport or a seaport authority. And we also have an industry development role, which is really a statewide set of tools that make business better because we're involved. I like to describe us as a catalyst. Sometimes there are deals and there are opportunities that just won't happen unless we're in the middle of it. Because we're there and we bring our tools, our chartered by the legislature tools to bear, deals happen, Florida's uh, a win, the companies place themselves in Florida and, um, and, and Florida wins. Jobs are created and all the other benefits. It's really a neat place to be and be able to see these things happen. The, under the Spaceport Authority tool, our relationship with FDOT and the TPO has been so important because as we watched, um, we all remember the 2008 timeframe with the economy collapsing, and then the space shuttle flew out in 2011, 8,000 jobs went away overnight. And what that did for us in the Space Florida world is, well, how can we help enable growth? And so we turned our focus on enabling industry growth. And this is just kind of our brag chart of projects 
we have been able to play a role in, in partnership with industry, a relatively small state investment, 265 million, to match a private investment of over 870 million. And that number continues to grow because they've chosen to make Florida home. And um, they're growing and growing and growing as they seek to win in a competitive market, a global competitive market. Um, we've got 15 projects underway right now uh, inside the team as we're continuing to kind of advance and, and, and deploy those resources to get those projects done, create jobs and return value to the people of Florida. And every project we do, we require return on investment analysis uh, for the, the state investment in infrastructure in Florida. And this is just a slide on that financing uh, toolbox I was talking about earlier. Again, this toolbox applies anywhere in the state on what we like to call public dirt. So if you are in an area that has an opportunity to win a project and it's on an airport or a, a seaport or anywhere where there's public dirt, if it's in the aerospace domain, we can bring our tools to bear. And it's a real win for both the corporations that we partner with, as well as the, um, as the state of Florida. It's a really powerful tool. We've got about you know, almost $2 billion of assets on our books as a result of using this tool across the state of Florida. So what's the future like? Planners are always thinking about the future. And uh, here's kind of what we think is, is gonna play out. We're gonna see over the next decade, a significant return of human spaceflight. So the top left-hand side, you can see the Boeing and Dragon capsules. You've, in the middle top, you've got the Virgin Orbit spacecraft, I'm um, sorry, Virgin Galactic, which will carry passengers up to the edge of space and back. Um, you've also got Virgin Orbit. You've got the uh, Dream Chaser. And then you have Elon Musk building a monster rocket ship called Starship, currently being built in Texas because he can test with impunity in the middle of nowhere at the south tip of Texas. Once this system is perfected and safer and, and it's got some real flight time under its belt, I believe we'll see it come here to Florida uh, with great confidence. And Florida will become a, another uh, significant hub for significant cargo and human inter, um, in, inner space travel. So it's a very exciting time in this industry as we're seeing this play out. And so from a planner's perspective, how do we enable this to happen? We're working closely with District 5 and a freight and mobility uh, study around the Cape is an active project ongoing. Certainly within the Cape, the infrastructure funded by the federal government to date, there's opportunities to bring private sector resources to bear and we're doing everything we can to help enable that to happen. Certainly, if we're gonna to go to the moon, you're gonna to need to build things to go there and do it. So we're working with a lot of companies that are exploring possibility of coming to Florida to set up their operations. We see a lot of opportunity there as well. And then we're gonna see small launch vehicles grow. Uh, we all love seeing the big ones, the space shuttles, the certainly the Falcon heavies, the Falcons and the Atlases of the world. But as this technology has matured, we're seeing small launch vehicles have a real home for small payloads that can really do some amazing things on orbit. So you have companies like Firefly, ABL, Rocket Lab, Rocket Crafters. There are tremendous number, probably about eight or 10 small companies kind of working in this space. And we're doing everything we can to win them to Florida to make Florida the place for this industry to happen. So again, what's the future look like? Back in the day, you only came here to launch rockets. That was the only reason you ever came to the Cape. Now we are doing launching and landing. We're building capsules here. We're using stages. We're manufacturing satellites in Florida. We've never done that before. We're manufacturing entire launch vehicles with Blue Origin building their new Glenn rocket right here on the Cape Canaveral spaceport, over 300 feet long. We had to re rebuild roads just to get the thing from the manufacturing facility up to the launch pad on the Cape. Where's it going in the future? If you have millions of people living and working in space, you need a pretty robust logistics enterprise. And the spaceport is gonna transition from being a primarily federal domain to a, to, to a real spaceport, like an airport domain. And how we do that over the next five, 10 years is gonna be a very exciting time. And um, it's really gonna open up the world for really an entire market in space. And we like to say, we'd like to see Florida be that leader for global space commerce. As I said earlier, you can leap off, leap off the surface of the earth anywhere on the surface of the earth. So our competition is really not other states. It's India, it's China, it's Russia, um, it's the European Space Agency in South America. 
And so as we try to compete in this global marketplace, we want to see Florida be the leader of enabling space commerce. And if I'm a business person in this industry and I say, gosh, where am I going to set up my headquarters? Where am I going to put my principal operations? We want their first thought to be, I want to go to Florida because the environment is good, the economic support is good, and I can do business there. And Florida becomes a center and kind of a, a hub of global space commerce. That's kind of where we see the future going. And I just want to thank you for the time to kind of share with you what we're doing in the space domain. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, all I can say all is, can say wow. <laughs> I think the future is bright and everyone loves space. So that, that is just so excited, exciting. So I'm, I'm sure that we're going to have lots of questions lots a, little of later. a little later. All right. All right. So um, if, 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 Mark, if, if anyone, anyone your, your microphone. Got it. Thanks. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Very good. All right. So next um, we have a couple more poll questions that we would like to put up and get your feedback on. Uh, the first one is, have you flown out of Orlando Melbourne International Airport? All right. That is that actually surprises me a little bit, but that that's very interesting. So about 26% yes. So a larger percentage has not flown out of Melbourne. Very good. Okay. Next question. True or false? Orlando Melbourne International Airport was voted number one most scenic airport approach in America. All right. Very large percent believe that that is true, and it is true. Uh, MLB has reigned as the number one most scenic airport in the USA since 2017, but this year has been elevated as the number one airport in North America and number four in the world. Um, and wow. You know, I can tell you, I can attest 100%, it is beautiful to fly out of that airport. So uh, that is very good. Okay, uh, next poll question. Orlando Melbourne International Airport is America's fastest growing airport in which of these categories? Passenger emplanements, aviation and aerospace manufacturing, or commercial flights? And the answer, uh, the most folks believe that it is uh, uh, aviation and aerospace manufacturing, and that is correct. Uh, MLB is the fastest grow growing aviation and aerospace manufacturing center in the US. Very good, excellent. All right. So moving on to our next panelist, uh, Cliff Graham has served as the Director of Operations and Maintenance at the Orlando Melbourne International Airport since 2015. His favorite word is safety, which remains the cornerstone of his management philosophy and is best known in airport circles for the remarkable achievement of six consecutive years of spotless FAA inspections. Cliff has supervised the operation of the airfield through its complete transformation of more than 100 million in capital improvements. Cliff is a recipient of the state's highest aviation award, named Florida's Aviation Professional of the Year in 2018, and also named 2018 Space Coast Business Leader of the Year in Aviation and Aerospace. He serves as Vice Chair of East Florida's continuing Florida Aviation System Planning Process, Planning Committee, as well as the Vice Chair of the Space Coast TPO Technical Advisory Council. 
Uh, he is certified member of the American Association of Airport Executives, a member of the 2015 Brevard County Executive Leadership Institute. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Environmental Management from Rollins College. Welcome, Cliff. Thank you so much, Georgiana. I really appreciate that uh, wonderful introduction and your remarks. And I, and I have to say, uh, thank you for your superior leadership uh, through transportation on the Space Coast. We'll get right into it. The Orlando Melbourne International Airport is essentially a small city. We have about 20,000 people that work, fly, and live at the airport every single day. Uh, right now, this year, we've had a $2.8 billion annual economic impact, and we soon will uh, surpass that going over $3 billion. Uh, as, as Georgiana mentioned, we're also known for our beaut beautiful scenic approach from the Atlantic Ocean and Indian River Lagoon as seen in this slide. We're a hotspot for aerospace engineering and manufacturing. MLB is a strategic intermodal system airport. No two airports are the same. If you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. We're served by Delta Airlines and American Airlines on the commercial aviation side. We do cater to the business traveler, but our holiday and leisure markets are picking up as well. There's been a modest increase uh, to annual commercial passengers over the last five years, with the exception of this year because of obvious, obvious reasons with the pandemic. TUI from the UK is the largest tour operator in the world. They're going to start service to MLB in spring of 2022. Uh, there, there's a seven year agreement in place to bring Western European visitors to Central Florida. This is gonna have a huge economic Im impact on the airport, the Space Coast and the region. TUI plans to base one of their cruise ships at Port Canaveral as part of this growth to our region. This is very exciting. And it's the first time that MLB and Port Canaveral will have this type of connection and working relationship. Uh, basically it's air to sea, with land in between, multimodal, intermodal facilities, both working together. The airport is in the design phase of a major terminal renovation and expansion as a result of airline growth, including TUI. Much of the current terminal architecture and finishes is from the, 19, is from the late 1980s, but we like to say our building has good bones. Upgraded areas include ticketing, concessions, TSA checkpoint, baggage screening, aircraft parking, passenger boarding areas, ground transportation, and the US Customs and Border Protection Federal Inspection Station. I did wanna note, we, we are using the uh, progressive design delivery method for this project because of the complexity of the project and the fact that we must successfully deliver the project in spring of 2022. Exit 182, the new Ellis Road interchange at I-95 was completed earlier this summer. It provides direct connection on a CIS corridor to the airport, that corridor being Ellis Road and NASA Boulevard. It's been an instant success. It saves about 10 minutes commuting to and from I-95. Upgrading the two-mile stretch of Ellis Road is the next phase in a vital connectivity upgrade for the airport and the surrounding region. And that project is number one on the Space Coast TPO project list, as well as number one on the regional MPO CIS project list. I want to say thank you to FDOT for having the vision and bringing the new interchange to life and to the continued efforts of the needed improvements to Ellis Road. And I want to draw everyone's attention to the photo on this slide. And in the foreground is the interchange, the interstate, and the background is, is the airport. And you can clearly see our main runway and just what an improvement, what a direct access uh, we, we have now. MLB has been selected as the world, oh, sorry. MLB is the epicenter of aviation, aerospace, and defense in Florida. High-tech aerospace tenants include Northrop Grumman, GE, Collins Aerospace, L3 Harris, Alstom, STS, Apex, Embraer, Southwest Aerospace and our newest tenant, 
Arion Supersonic. MLB has been selected as the world headquarters for Arion Supersonic. Arion is developing and will manufacture the AS2 supersonic jet in Melbourne. They're bringing 675 jobs and investing $300 million in our community. Arion has leased nearly 100 acres at the airport and is designing their campus that will start construction in 2021. This last slide shows how the airport, Port Canaveral, and the Kennedy Space Center are economic pillars that are linked in this community. We are so proud to be part of this list, and I am so proud to be with all of you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. That was very good. Lots of really good information. All right, so we have a couple more poll questions before our next panelist. And the first one is, have you taken a cruise from Port Canaveral? Ah, a large percentage of folks have taken a cruise out of Port Canaveral. And if you haven't, you really should at some point. It is one of the most relaxing vacations ever. All right, about 46% of the attendees have taken a cruise out of Port Canaveral. Excellent. Moving on to the next question. Port Canaveral is currently ranked as the world's second busiest cruise port in multi-day embarkations. True or false? And the answer is true. Port Canaveral is currently ranked as the world's second busiest cruise port in multi-day embarkations and has been in the top for years. Very good, very busy port. And then the final question. How many cruise passengers did Port Canaveral record in 2018? Wow. Okay, so this one is a little uh, a little all over the place, but the correct answer is Port Canaveral had 4.6 million cruise passengers pass through their facility in 2018. Very good. All right, so moving on to our next panelist and industry leader, uh, Cliff Graham, uh, excuse me, I apologize, um, Bill, uh, Bill Crow is a 22-year veteran of construction management and maritime port development with a breadth of experience in deep water crews and cargo port operations. His assignments have included strategic planning, program management, construction management, and quality assurance of large marine, civil, and industrial projects. Currently, he serves as the Vice President of Facilities, Engineering, and Construction at the Canaveral Port Authority as Vice President. Bill is responsible for capital budget strategic planning, infrastructure assessments, and long-range planning for Port Canaveral facilities, briefing of the public, port commissioners, and the port CEO on current capital project status updates, and for the direction of roughly 770 managers, engineers, and facility technicians. Wow, welcome, Bill. Thank you, Georgiana. And I just wanted to uh, start off by thanking uh, Space Coast TPO for their partnership and their involvement in today's forum. Also, FDOT District 5, Central Florida Transportation Planning Group, and um, my, my colleagues that are presenting today, Mark and Cliff. And I just have to say at the outset here that these are both very tough acts to follow. Um, I was uh, very impressed by uh, business opportunities, projected growth with both of those organizations, and uh, we are in very good company. So it's an honor for me personally to be presenting here today, 
and I will start off with a, a brief history of Port Canaveral. For some of you who aren't really familiar with Port Canaveral, we were a, we're a man-made port. We were dedicated back in 1953. Similar to Space Florida, we are a special district of the state of Florida. Our origins go back to a small fishing and oil port. Uh, a lot of citrus came through our facility. And it's a little note of pride that even today, many years later, many decades later, we still have a lot of those industries active in Port Canaveral. Fuel, citrus industry, and a, a still a, a robust, a small but robust commercial fishing fleet operates out of Port Canaveral. We are a landlord port, so we own about 3,000 acres, 3,300 acres, and you might find it interesting that only 1,100 acres or so are actually dry, usable, and upland facilities. So the rest of it is submerged land. In that 1,100 acres, we've squeezed 240 tenants and subtenants. And I'm going to, in a later slide, cover uh, some of the areas around Port Canaveral so you'll be able to see the concentration of tenants that we have. We're governed by five publicly elected commissioners. Uh, the, the port district uh, occupies probably one third to one half of Brevard County. We ceased levying those taxes back in 1986. And since then, we've been, been able to survive solely on port operating revenue. I'm gonna to touch on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on our operating revenue at a few points throughout the, the presentation here. But what I wanted to note at the, at the onset is that one of the silver linings that I witnessed and my team has witnessed through the pandemic is it has really helped uh, streamline and make more efficient um, initiatives, opportunities between Space Coast TPO, District 5, Space Florida, the airport, and the seaport. So I look forward to uh, seeing all of us capitalize and benefit from those future uh, very streamlined initiatives. A little bit about our historic economic impact. Back in 2018, we did a study through BRIA. I've got their website there at the bottom of that. Uh, uh, the, the slide, very, very good organization to work with. We, at that time, were projecting a $3.9 billion total impact from Port Canaveral. Now, that's not just Brevard County. That's not just Central Florida even. But, but because of the cruise industry, that is a global impact that a tiny little Port Canaveral has uh, on the market, $3.9 billion. And we supported 32,000 jobs through our activities. Those jobs generated 1.3 billion in wages. So just a tremendous amount of impact from uh, Little Port Canaveral located in here in Brevard, Brevard County uh, through our various industries. Now, how has COVID-19 impacted our port? Well, it's had a very substantial impact. And if you listen to Captain Murray, my CEO, through our port commission meetings on a monthly basis, you'll be able to keep tabs on that impact. Our book of business in the cruise industry was about 80% of our portfolio. So if you can imagine uh, about mid-March when cruising halted due to that federal government CDC no sale order, just a substantial crushing impact to Port Canaveral's um, operating revenue. We were projecting to be in about a $118 million revenue by the end of this fiscal year that just ended at the end of September. We unaudited or tracking about 63 million to date. So just a very substantial impact to our annual revenue in 2019, FY 2020. And uh, some of that is gonna continue on into FY 21. However, we are really looking forward to the return of cruising and that CDC no sale order is actually set to expire and hopefully it does, does not get extended here in a couple of days, midnight, October 31st. And I'll touch a little bit more on that in a couple of slides. Just an overview of the port. This gray area right here is our maritime center, our administrative offices. We have two main cargo areas on the north side and the south side. And I wanna point out on the north side, that fuel terminal right here supplies 100% uh, of the bonded international fuel out of Orlando International Airport and Melbourne Airport as well. We contribute there. And also all of the fuel you might purchase at a gas station locally throughout Brevard County comes out of that fuel terminal on the north side. So very strategic facility for us. Here's our main cruise areas, and this include uh, six active terminals and then one which is reserved for our gaming ship. 
we are unique. I worked at Port Miami and Port of Houston Authority, and Port Canaveral is very unique in the recreational assets that we offer. The Cove District, if you haven't visited the port, I would encourage you to do so and take advantage of uh, one of many of our waterfront restaurants. And we have a marina district, and we have a substantial number of tenants and subtenants in this area. If you are a recreational boater and you need to have anything done on your on your vessel, uh, just visit our marina district. You can you can have pretty much anything done on your boat. I wanted to demonstrate um, a, a bit about how landlocked we are as a port. You see here to our south, that is the jurisdictional boundary with the city of Cape Canaveral. And what surprises many people is this next uh, category. Those red areas are actually owned by the federal government. The Army Corps of Engineers owns and operates the lock system. U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary has a, uh, a fee simple property that they own in the middle of our North Cargo Berth area. And then all of that area to the upper right is owned by the U.S. Uh, Air Force as a part of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So you see that based on uh, these limits, how limited we are at the port. And um, we are certainly in the mode of redevelopment of, of areas as opposed to developing greenfield projects. A little bit about our cargo. So most of our cargo is bulk, liquid bulk, which is the fuel petroleum products, dry bulk, uh, what's called break bulk. Um, and you can see in this photo right here, we actually handle a lot of newsprint still comes through Port Canaveral. Roll on, roll off our, our, our vehicle, our automotive business, containerized. We do have some containerized goods, but these last two I'm really excited about, heavy lift and project cargo. We've seen a lot of FBL projects come through the port, some other projects that support commercial space. And you see in the lower photo there, we've had several of those uh, Falcon 9 first stage boosters that have successfully landed on uh, SpaceX's drone ships come back through the port. So that's a, a unique uh, book of business that we didn't have four years ago and we're really, really excited about seeing that partnership grow. Here's just a few highlights about our cargo facilities. And I wanted to focus on um, this. We own the largest mobile harbor crane in the United States. So it's a 150 ton lever crane brought over from Germany, supported 50% by state of Florida through grant funding. And we've made great use of that. It's large enough to pick the Falcon 9 booster. And it's also robust enough to handle uh, a lot of these very heavy vessel uh, project cargo that we see coming through the port. You see my cargo numbers there at the bottom, 6.3 million short tons of cargo moved through Port Canaveral in 2019. We did see a decrease in that, just under 4.8 million short tons of uh, cargo came through us in the year 2020, which we just closed out. We did a strategic master plan back in 2016 and 2017, and I'm showing you this slide. Obviously, we, we have felt substantial impacts from the COVID pandemic. However, the areas of growth that we are still focused on are largely those bulk materials for construction. So hearing about the development at Melbourne Airport, DOT's various roadway projects, and also Space Florida, a lot of those aggregates, construction materials, uh, lumber, they come through Port Canaveral. And so that's a unique, and I'm going to use the word synergy, sometimes it gets overused, but that is certainly a unique synergy that we have coming through uh, Port Canaveral. I want to highlight a couple of specific projects here that we have uh, completed and are completing. North Cargo Berth 8 is one of those facilities that uh, we've had our eyes on for many years. It is a heavy lift berth. So typically our berths can manage about 1,200 pounds per square foot. This one is over 2,000 pounds per square foot, has the ability to uh, receive our mobile harbor crane over there. And it's uh, a targeted commercial space and also heavy project cargo berth. It was built in three different phases. The original bulkhead was completed for about $19 million, and you see some of our partners there. The success of the port is certainly built on our local and Florida statewide uh, contracting partners, including uh, grant financing from FDOT and FSTED grants. The second phase was the uplands and site work, and we just completed that about $4 million, and then we recently did a pier extension here. So it gives us a, a length overall, an LOA of 900 feet at that, at that berth. And we have another phase, another pier extension that we're planning 180 foot, um, that would make it a 1200 foot overall berth. That's temporarily been put on hold given the revenue uh, issues that we're having, but we're looking to bring that back in, in, the, near, in the future years. Another project I wanna highlight, North Cargo Berth 3 reconstruction, 
It's an 880 foot long berth. You can see in that photo that is certainly an aged facility. It was built in uh, 1973 originally. It's uh, designed to go down to a minus 43 dredge depth, which is very sufficient for bulk handling cargo ships. Cruise ships typically dredge about 30 feet and a much wider post Panamax vessel of 131 feet wide beam will be able to go at that facility. So we're really excited about that. We had a virtual site visit with MARAD. Maritime Administration is a part of the US DOT and they are assisting us with a port infrastructure development program grant, about 14.1 million. In addition to that grant, the state of Florida is also helping us out through FDOT with another 14.1 million. Our matching funds will be about $8 million in order to complete this project. We will, uh, we're having various me meetings with Marat through, through technical review, working through those comments, and our grant agreement should be finalized by the end of this year. This project, if you know of any marine contractors, is gonna hit the street next summer. We're gonna set this project up for bidding and award at the end of uh, September, which is the end of our FY22. We'll break ground beginning of FY22 in October 1st of next year. So very excited about that project. Going to shift gears here, talk a little bit about the cruise industry, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I, I want to compliment whoever came up with the little kitten shaking its head no on the, the have you been on a Port Canaveral cruise yet or not. So who, who can resist, you know, a cute little kitten? But uh, cruising will come back. We are projecting to get the Mardi Gras vessel, which is Carnival's XL class vessel. It's actually gonna be at Port Canaveral the second week of January. So that'll be here before we know it. It's a 6,600 passenger vessel, the newest in Carnival's fleet. And it is also the newest, uh, or the it will be the first liquefied natural gas powered cruise ship in North America. So there's so many firsts to talk about with that partnership with Carnival and the Cruise Terminal 3 project that we completed. As you see here on the slide, cruising generated approximately 80% of our revenue. We know that that will come back. It's not gonna turn back on like a light switch. It's gonna be more like a dimmer switch over the next couple of years, but we are making preparations for that. We have uh, more than 20 cruise lines operating out of Port Canaveral. You know of many of the, the original four, Disney, Carnival, Norwegian, and Royal, but if you've been following the news, we're really excited about this new partnership with MSC. They're gonna be bringing some very beautiful ships to Port Canaveral uh, as soon as the CDC raises that no sale order. We're also home port to Victory Casino Cruises, which is a, a 365 day a year, twice a day uh, gaming vessel that operates out of cruise terminal number two. We recent, recently completed terminal three, our largest project ever to date at 163 million. And we're currently working on the Disney expansion of Terminal 8 and 10. Disney is bringing in, in the year 22, 2022, they're bringing the new Wish. So it's their newest class of vessel, about the same size as the existing class, but well-appointed and also LNG powered. That's the Disney Wish. Look for that to come in 22. Back to our strategic master plan. As you can see here, we were projecting uh, a overall increase in cruise traffic. We are still projecting that. We know it will come back. We currently operate seven cruise terminals, one that we just finished in Terminal 3, and then we do have that gaming vessel. Uh, and I can tell you that we are still planning future cruise expansion. Uh, Cliff mentioned the partnership with TUI. We have other partnerships like MSC that have been announced. We have uh, existing terminals that we're looking to expand. So um, if you're interested, please continue to uh, Monitor Port Canaveral, come to our commission meetings. Uh, there's still plenty of work to be done at our port. I'm gonna show you a little bit about Cruise Terminal 8, what we're doing for Disney. This is a 20 year old floor, uh, terrazzo floor that we're renovating within that terminal, but we're spending 35, $36 million on this Cruise Terminal 8 project through a, a couple of great local partners, PCL and Herd Construction on the land side, and then uh, Rush Marine on the, uh, on the marine side. We've got some substantial completion dates coming up in early April for that project. You see a shot of our, our new baggage laydown area. Obviously these uh, projects cost money, so we continue to outlay capital financing to get these projects done, working with our marine partners on some marine works there at Terminal 10. And uh, we, similar to any airport that you've been on, we have jetway style passenger boarding bridges, at least the one at Terminal 8 is a jetway style bridge. That's gonna come over fully assembled late this year for final commissioning at Terminal 8. 
I have uh, just a couple pictures of what we recently did at Terminal 3 and then a short video. We hosted Carnival Cruise Lines earlier this, uh, just la earlier last week. They were looking at a few of our terminals that they historically have operated out in addition to Terminal 3. Carnival, along with all of the other cruise lines, are currently working with the CDC on their return to cruising plans. And so the point of this site visit was to visit these three terminals, identifying areas where we might do passenger testing, healthcare screening. We uh, are, are looking at how can we best repurpose those existing facilities to accommodate a safe and uh, healthy return to cruising. So it's, it's touched on subjects such as HVAC filtration, outside air, um, testing and balancing, obviously sanitization of high touch surfaces, social distancing. So we're taking a whole new look at what has been a traditional operation for uh, cruising passengers. I think historically passengers could show up at uh, any given time over a six hour window and still get on the ship. The cruise lines are really gonna be focusing on passenger X needs to show up in this 30 minutes um, in order to go through proper screening and, and uh, health check questionnaires in order to get on the vessel. So those plans are being developed. We are taking part in the development of those plans and really um, waiting on the CDC, uh, the federal government to take action and help out the cruise industry. So original $163 million was our budget. I wanna highlight that as a state entity, we don't pay sales tax on materials. We shepherded our funds well, and we actually came back with an $8 million savings on that total program budget. So we're very proud about that and glad to see uh, this project complete. Carnival spent about 3.5 million in premium features, and it is one of the most well-appointed terminals that we've uh, ever constructed, as you see here. Still waiting on Carnival Cruise Line and CBP to move in well in advance of a planned return for uh, guest operations and passenger traffic. I have a video that I want to show you. Give me a second to pull that up. So anybody who uh, checked no on it, I haven't cruised out of Port Canaveral, that's what I want you to see. So get on Carnival's website, look at the itineraries upcoming for the uh, Mardi Gras that's gonna be cruising out of Port Canaveral. We are very optimistic that by late January, February, um, you'll see that cruising come back. You'll be able to experience cruise to number three. You'll be able to experience a brand new ship 
in the uh, Mardi Gras, which by the way, does have a roller coaster on top of it. So moving forward, uh, what are our, actually, let me touch on this real quick. Our uh, roadways, I don't want to um, not underscore how important efficient traffic management in and out of Port Canaveral has been. Uh, two major initiatives that we've had recently, also working in conjunction with the state of Florida through the Department of Economic Opportunity, have been a port-wide wayfinding and signage program. We've redone signage throughout the port and on major roadways in and out of the port, variable message signs, static signs. In addition to that, we've redone a lot of our roadway network on the north side to support that cruise activity, also supported by DEO grant funding. And both of those projects have really augmented the, the cruise passenger experience in and out of Port Canaveral, so I certainly wanted to underscore those. Moving forward, I know Georgiana Gillette with Space Coast TPO highlighted these projects earlier, and I want to underscore them again. The State Road 401 Bridge Alternatives Evaluation, that PD&E is out on the street. Um, you can see some of the dates there, some con information from the DOT's website on how to um, get involved in that PD&E. So we're really excited uh, for that project moving forward, and I want to thank District 5 and Space Coast TPO for making that a priority. And in addition to that, the widening of 528, uh, very key crucial corridor for the area, for the port, the spaceport and the airport. And um, it is very timely to see the plans to widen that to six lanes. So I've got some additional information there. These are certainly part of our legislative priorities moving forward, uh, as is COVID relief uh, funds for uh, mun municipalities like Port Canaveral, and I just want to end with this slide, and I want to want to thank uh, the opportunity to take part in the panel. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Cliff and Mark, for their brilliant presentations, and also DOT District 5, Space Coast TPO, Central Florida Transportation Planning Group. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bill. Excellent presentation. I just have to say that, you know, the Space Coast TPO, uh, we really value our partnerships with, with all three of these uh, industry leaders and modal agencies. And quite frankly, our success depends on our partnership with them and um, the level of professionalism uh, that all three of these agencies uh, exhibit is just exceptional. So I will just say thank you very much. So at this point, I think we can segue uh, to our panel discussion. Um, I think there are some questions coming in and uh, presenters, if you'd like, you may uh, go ahead and turn on your uh, webcams. Um, if any of the attendees have questions, submit your question via the question pod, and we will try to get as many of those answered as possible. Um, all right, so just to kind of kick it off, uh, this question is for all three of you. Intermodal connectivity is the efficient transfer of both people and freight between all transportation modes. Freight is a major component of the three modes, space, air, and sea represented here today. What are the priorities and challenges for the movement of goods to and from space, air, and sea. Um, Mark, would you like to, to kick that one off first? Yeah, gladly. The, the, um, the amount of freight going to space right now, right, compared to the freight that Bill and Cliff hey, Mark, are running. Mark, I think we're getting some audio degrading. Say again, say again. Having a little bit of audio issues, so if you want to maybe try switching to no audio and then back to computer audio, that should resolve it. Is this any better? Much better. Much better. Good. I'm glad you interrupted it. So the amount of freight we're talking about going to space is so small compared to what Bill and, and Cliff deal with in their in their modes. We aren't stressing out the other modes at this point, but I do believe in the future when, you know, you look at Jeff Bezos and his company Blue Origin, their vision is millions of people living and working in space. 
And you let that sink in for a minute, millions of people, millions of people need a lot of water. They need a lot of food. They need a lot of clothing. They need all the things human beings need. And so we're going to see a significant growth in the requirement to deliver freight to space. And right now, it's pretty hard. Um, ver vertically fighting gravity for about 100 miles is a real challenge. And that's why we use rockets and rocket power to go do that thing straight up. You got to get going 17,000 miles an hour before you can kind of relax because you'll stay up there 17,000 miles an hour. And so I think what we're going to see, and that's why I really appreciate the FDOT leadership, is we're going to see uh, eventual stresses on the other corridors that feed the spaceport. Uh, the seaport's got plenty of capacity today, uh, but as we heard from Bill, there's there's challenges, and he's working those those really hard. We're going to, the roads have plenty of capacity today. The Indian River Bridge, notwithstanding, as that issue works its way through, that'll get fixed. Um, but long term, we, we're going to have to have a very robust throughput in order to handle the demand that's going to going to hit us in the space domain. Very good. All very right. Good. All right. Um, Clef, you, would you like to go next? Sure, Georgiana. Yeah, freight and uh, cargo in the aviation uh, industry is, is a really big deal uh, in this state. Uh, I can tell you uh, airports like Miami and Jacksonville, Tampa are, are leaders. And, um, you know, th there's, there's lots of, the reason that's the case is because of their seaports and then, uh, you know, proximity to uh, you know, good highway systems and rail and things like that. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, our airport, Melbourne, is is located equal distance between Jacksonville and um, and Miami. And of course, we're 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 very close to Port Canaveral. And we do we do get some uh, freight and some cargo in and out of here. But we are under underserved. But I and I'll go back to what I talked a little bit about in my presentation with the. Um, improve connectivity, that's a really big deal. That, that can entice uh, uh, more freight, uh, and more, more cargo opportunities in and out of here. Just, just you know, the ease at which you can get in and out of the airport you know, you know, through the road system, uh, you know, that 10 minutes in both directions, that's 20 minutes uh, saved in driving is, is a huge, huge uh, uh, big deal. So, um, you know, it, like I said, it's it's a really important uh, piece to aviation in the state of Florida. We are uh, underserved in, in this area, uh, and it's it's a market that uh, we we certainly look to uh, look to grow. Yes, very good point, Cliff. Uh, Bill, would you like to address that as well? Thank you, Georgiana. Yeah, there's three things I'd like to highlight, and I want to reflect back on something that Mark shared in his presentation. One is just the the, it may not be the frequency of the the space commodities yet, but however, as he spoke to just the, the sheer size of the first stage of the Falcon 9, and then looking forward to the new Glenn, the size of that fuselage, and they're also planning to do water-based landings and retrieve that first stage at least, you know, from a mar using a maritime component like Port Canaveral. So working in conjunction with Space Florida, it's been neat to see them getting out ahead of that and planning roadway improvements. And as, as my colleagues listening into this call can imagine, um, the presence of signalized intersections. If you have a fuselage that's 30 feet tall, it, there's some, some geometric challenges there, obviously. And so it's been very encouraging to see the infrastructure planning, the advanced infrastructure planning coming out of Space Florida. We've been able to play a, a small role in that to support that effort just the sheer size, magnitude, dimensions of, um, of, of the space, uh, commodity, not commodities, but the fuselages that are gonna be coming through the port. Um, that's been very important uh, for us to be a part of as well. And then what Cliff mentioned earlier about the, the TUI partnership, um, it's an airline and a cruise line. Passengers are gonna fly into the airport. They're gonna be transported in a safe and healthy manner to Port Canaveral to be, you know, to board a ship. So it underscores the importance of that Ellis Road connection. And it is a current connection. Are there room for improvements and efficiency all the way over to the airport? Yes, there are. And so I think uh, partnerships like that really highlight that as a project. As far as us at Port Canaveral, the initiatives that I covered at the end of that project, really, Georgiana, you are intimately familiar with those, as is Allison at DOT District 5. 
those are key for us. The widening of 528 to six lanes, the, the uh, PD&E that's gonna study the bascule bridges over the 401, over the barge canal, um, the lock system, the importance of that fuel terminal on the north side of the port from a critical standpoint, a strategic standpoint, post storm event, and uh, making those bridges more robust, more dependable. Um, those are key initiatives for corridors for the port moving forward. So thank you for that question. It's, it's really good to be able to highlight those, those important factors. Yes, uh, the critical infrastructure, the corridors, uh, that it, it's just so critical for our area. And um, and so I think any any time that we can highlight that is 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 really good. Um, you know these critical corridors. I mean it, it's going to cost a lot of money to to be able to implement these projects, but they have to be at the top of the list uh, as we move forward and uh, and and work to get those done. We have some very unique challenges here on the Space Coast when it comes to infrastructure and and the size of of the uh, the equipment that is coming through. All right, so we have another question here. Uh, Bill, this is for you. Port Canaveral has a very diverse set of operations, um, as we've heard, cargo, crews, and space. What preparations are you doing to support the increased space operations? Excellent question. And a couple of the projects that I highlighted in my PowerPoint slide deck uh, play right into that very well. North Cargo Berth 8. A few years back, that was a zero entry, entry undeveloped shoreline, a sandy beach, so to speak. Through partnerships with FSTED, FDOT, we've been able to turn that into an asset that I, I don't know has been fully recognized. It's when I say 2,000 pounds per square foot, that is an enormous capacity in a heavy lift berth. We, we've constructed a lifting, a, a relieving platform that's buried underground. It's like a 30 inches thick concrete pile supported platform to, to accommodate that weight. The, um, so the heavy lift berth capacity, the largest mobile harbor crane in the United States to help lift those space components. It was. It was specifically designed. We added like a 12 meter extension to the uh, the main boom of that crane in order to accommodate the Falcon 9. That crane from Lieber has a big sister that could potentially lift the new Glen, which is just an enormous piece of you know of technology. It's just enormous. It's an aluminum can, you know, from a civil engineer stand standpoint, but it's just very large. Um, so I'd say that tongue in cheek. And also the North Cargo with three project another partnership with DOT and Maran. Both of those are strategic for Port Canaveral for our bulk handling capability. But across the board, they will handle roll-on, roll-off cargo. They will handle space cargo. And I, I can't underscore enough the, the, the necessity of our future developments to be multi-user, to support space, to support other commodities that are come through Port Canaveral. Uh, and, and certainly back to the, the size of these space components that we're seeing, those are those are key, key projects. Yes, very, very good. All right, we have another question. This is for Mark. What is the purpose of a launch? All right, all right. can you hear me okay? Is it, is it coming across efficient? Right, yes, right. it is. Okay, good. Um, so, what is the purpose? Of purpose? That's a great question. Um, um, let's give you an example. Uh, GPS. GPS. We all use GPS to get around. Hey, Mark, when we I'm need sorry, it's starting to break up now. Um, all right, right, let me try this again. I'm going to that. Stand by. Stand by. <laughs> is this any better? Yes, that sounds good. Yes, that sounds good. All right, I'm going to do that regularly before in between okay, questions. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Reset. Um, think about GPS. We all use GPS to travel, right? Uh, the GPS satellites are 11,000 miles out from the surface of the Earth. There are 48 satellites that provide global broadband, I'm sorry, global coverage, so that any time in the world, anywhere in the world, at any time of day, there are at least four satellites in your field of view. 
your phone or your watch or whatever you use to figure out where you are has a little receiver that receives signals coming down from that satellite and it triangulates your position on the surface of the earth based upon satellites that are 11,000 miles away. Each one of those satellites has a super accurate clock and that clock signal, very simply, just does a time calculation, figures out how far you are from that, that satellite and does the math in your little phone that tells you where you are. It's really quite amazing. So there's just one example of a purpose of a launch. Somehow you gotta get that satellite out there 11,000 miles out to be able to provide that benefit to those of us on the surface of the earth. Um, other examples be communications. If you're doing global communications, you're gonna bounce off satellites to get around the world. Although there is undersea fiber, satellites are very actively used. And much of your TV communications, direct TV, for example, if you have a direct TV dish on the side of your house, you put that on the side of your house, you point that antenna, you do it one time because that satellite at 22,000 miles an hour, 22,000 miles away from the surface of the earth is actually rotating around the earth. And it just appears to remain fixed because it takes 24 hours for that satellite to go around the earth. It takes 24 hours for the earth to spin. You point your direct TV dish one time and that satellite appears to remain fixed, but it's not. You've got to get that satellite out there, 22,000 miles. So I don't know if that gets to the heart of the question. I'd be more than happy to kind of explore more. But we need space to kind of live our daily lives. And putting satellites up there helps us do that. Very good. Thank Very you, Mark. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, so this question um, is being addressed to all the presenters. Um, and it's uh, in 2018, uh, the Space Coast TPO in partnership with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council completed a sea level rise vulnerability assessment for Brevard County. In the coming months, the TPO will be developing a resiliency master plan. Um, we all know Brevard County is a coastal community. Are you taking any steps, uh, each one of the agencies, to address sea level rise and coastal resiliency in your particular area? Uh, Cliff, would you like to go first? Sure, Georgiana. Yes, um, I mean, that's something we're certainly looking at. We're taking it seriously, but uh, I'm sure it's, it's probably an area that Mark and Bill are watching a little more closely than I am, just because of their geographic location. Uh, to the coast. Our airport sits about 26 uh, feet above uh, sea level. So we're, we're in pretty good shape as far as that is concerned. And we also have, you know, the barrier island and, uh, you know, the Indian River Lagoon and, and, a, and a pretty large river bluff uh, to, to our east. So uh, yes, you know, we're concerned. We're concerned about, you know, uh, you know, folks in our region and, and, and what's happening. And of course, we've seen what's, what's happening in South Florida down there in uh, Miami, Miami Beach. So, uh, but like I said, I think I think Mark and, and Bill are probably a little bit more concerned than, than we are. Yes, I think so. All right, Mark, would you like to take it? <laughs> Certainly, am I coming across okay this time? All right, good. Very, very simply, the Air Force uh, and NASA are the two federal organizations that own the land. And so they are watching it very closely, as you can imagine, and planning very, very term. Air Force did a master plan a few years back that moved all the launch pads from on the ocean to kind of across the street to back them up away from the ocean. Now, industry, on the other hand, says, I want to be right on the ocean. And they're rolling in and building their launch pads right on the ocean. But I imagine what we're seeing is them add a little bit of height and anticipating the sea level rise concerns as they're, they're doing their designs and as they're, they're built very robust in launch infrastructure, sure, it's gonna be able to kind of address that. We have seen some erosion right on the beach in front of our launch pad at Complex 46. The Air Force is directly involved in a major planning project to kind of back off the ocean to some degree uh, by just adding some barriers that will kind of kind of create a more of a false kind of reef there to kind of um, kind of get us more time. But it is something that we continue to watch continually. I'm sure Bill is dealing directly with it in every bit of what they're doing at the port. Yes, thank you, Mark. Bill? Thank you, Mark and Cliff and Georgiana. Excellent question. And I, there's so much to talk about with sea level rise right now. So I hope I can articulate this effectively. We do have an internal study that we're, that we're um, performing right now. What I wanna clarify is we're not reinventing the science there. In addition to uh, the Space Coast TPO effort, there's NOAA data, there's core data. There's currently 
an ongoing initiative that we're involved with with the Army Corps of Engineers. It's called the South Atlantic Coastal Study, the SAC study. It's due to be published in FY in, in 20, calendar year 2022. So what we are doing right now is we are collecting all of the applicable studies, including the one that you just referenced, the SAC study, the NOAA data, to try to, you know, uh, to assess what the ranges are. I think that the engineer in me always wants to know what's the number? What do I need to be planning facilities to? Well, I've learned over the past couple of years, it's not that simple. At Port Canaveral, once we establish what those ranges are, we've got to look at the hydrodynamics of how does that storm surge uh, behave when it enters Port Canaveral Harbor? What do we need to model? There's also, there's risk-based assessments that we are currently performing as well. Do I need to elevate all of my cruise terminals by three feet? That is, it's not financially feasible for us to do that for a couple of different reasons. One, just the sheer cost of their existing building. But when it comes to maritime traffic, our ships today, they're floating on current sea levels. If I build a berth three feet higher than uh, my, my, my 12 feet data mean little of water, I won't be able to access shell doors, passenger doors, luggage doors because of the sea level of today. However, back to that risk-based analysis, when I build new terminals, there's internal infrastructure that I can elevate. Even if the finished floor of my building is not three feet higher, it's a concrete floor. As you saw in the Disney photo, it's a polished concrete floor where we lay down luggage. Not a lot of damage. My piers don't get damaged if they get overtopped by water. But I can elevate those internal IT rooms, uh, mechanical floors. I can elevate external emergency backup generators. I can elevate uh, sanitary sewer lift station and other critical facilities, and that's where we're going. We need to understand what the science is, what the range is, locally, how does that affect Port Canaveral and our harbor, and then projecting out over the next, maybe five is the most near-term resolution we look at, but 10 years, 20 years, even 50 years out. What's the capital outlay that we need to do to elevate emergency generators? What do I need to do to elevate sanitary sewer lift stations. What year do I need to start to affect those changes um, in order to accommodate sea level rise? So that's the strategy, that's the approach that we're taking. Let's understand the science first, let's apply it locally to us, and then let's be strategic about, from a risk-based standpoint, what we elevate and when we elevate it moving forward. It's, it's, it's complex, but it's a very interesting uh, topic for us, and it's certainly part of our current legislative priorities. Very good. That's very interesting. All right. So moving on, uh, Mark, what do you think will be the biggest limiting factor in growth of the space industry in Florida? Well, the biggest limiting factor is going to be market. If we don't win market that could go to other places in the world, it won't come here. Um, and so how do we win market? And, and from a Space Florida perspective, we win market by creating an environment that makes it easy to do business. You know, the Melbourne team and, and Cliff's crew down there at the Melbourne airport have created an environment that's made it attractive for Embraer, for Arion, for Northrop Grumman and others to come and do that work there at the Melbourne airport. So from a Space Florida perspective, we want to work closely with our friends at the Space Force, our friends at NASA, our friends at FDOT and the TPO and certainly the port and all the other players in this community to make it a place they want to come. And if we do that, I think our biggest challenge will be getting all the infrastructure ready for all of those activities to take place. And frankly, that's a challenge we'd love to have. That's good. Thank you. All right, so we have another question, um, and I think this will be for all three of you. It'll be interesting to get your perspective on this. As new corporations are moving into Brevard related to space investments, uh, Orlando Melbourne uh, International Airport and the port, quality of life would be an important consideration in recruiting good talent. What needs to happen in Brevard County in terms of transportation infrastructure to ensure that we're providing a better quality of life for our existing and new residents. Cliff, would you like to take that one first? Sure, uh, Georgina, that's a really good question. And I, I'm a lifelong Brevard County resident. So, you know, I, you know I've seen this, it's a reality. Uh, it's something we all face, but um, you hit on a really good point, quality of life. And that's, 
you, you mentioned the companies that have come into Brevard County. Um, that's one of that's one of the attractants for uh, a good quality workforce uh, that that this Space Coast has is the quality of life. You know the uh, the beaches. Uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, it's a beautiful place to live, um, you know, and it's relatively inexpensive to live compared to other other areas of the of the country and, you know, the weather. It, it's just, it's it's a mecca for, for engineers. There's probably more engineers in Brevard County per square mile than anywhere else in the world. Um, but, uh, you know, simply put, we've got to keep up, we've got to keep up with the capacity uh, that that's happening, and we've we've got to invest and uh, make improvements to to our roads uh, and make you know connectivity uh, a priority. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about Ellis Road; that's a big one. John Roads, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, Malabar Road, south of here, is still a two-lane road with little ditches on either side. Um, that's just that's that's not that's not a selling point. Uh, for attracting you know high quality uh, individuals and workforce into our area we 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 do have we do a great job we need to do better uh in in my opinion in this regard uh to keep up uh with uh, with with the with the demand thank you yes that is a very good point very good point and i you know, I had mentioned earlier that we want to connect and we want to have connected communities connect where we live to where we work and play. And that is also a very important part, providing those multimodal facilities, um, you know, not being so reliant on automobiles, um, you know, looking at development patterns to preserve our natural resources, but while increasing economic diversity and quality of life, it's like a change in mindset. That needs to happen. So we do have some challenges um, with funding, uh, with our infrastructure, uh, but we do think that, um, you know, we're hopeful that uh, things will get better from a funding perspective. Uh, you know, we have the challenge with the gas tax revenue and the fact that it's just not keeping up with uh, with the demand and, uh, and what is going to happen in the future. Um, hopefully with a new, uh, you know, a federal authorization, we will ha be able to have a, a new direction or new options when it comes to funding. So we do have some challenges with that. Bill, would you like to address that? Thank you, Georgiana, and I would. So being a, a parent of children, I always tout Brevard County Schools as a major asset to the area. I've lived and worked in, in Houston and Miami and Dallas, Fort Worth, and as many of you major metropolitan areas, you know, across the country and even internationally. And there are certainly many benefits that come with those larger areas as far as amenities, things to do. However, there are also many challenges, traffic, capacity uh, that plague those areas. When I think about recruitment in this area, I don't necessarily go directly to capacity or, or the commercial opportunities. But I think about direct recruitment. So at Port Canaveral, what we have focused on recently in recent years has been a recruitment process. We go to the Maritime Academies. We have a junior ambassador program. We have a helm program at Rockledge High School. So we want to take the position of education. Let's educate those that are high school age about what the maritime industry is, what opportunities there may be. Let's reach out to our feeder schools like Maritime Academies. Let's educate them about the location of, of Port Canaveral. And I'm, I'm sure there's many uh, parallels to the airport, the aviation industry, the spaceport, the space industry that would be the same. That's where I think we need to focus our efforts on an apprenticeship oriented program to help educate and train that next generation. The opportunities are here in Bavard County and there are plenty of things to do. We have a good transportation system. We have excellent schools. We need to get the word out about what Bavard County is. What are the opportunities? Look at the people on the panel. And I'm not speaking about necessarily Port Canaveral, but Space Florida, Melbourne Airport. Look at the manufacturing, the engineering, the, the careers that are developing here locally, you will not find this in other areas. It is such a unique opportunity. We need to get the word out. 
Yeah, that's good. Uh, Mark, would you like to uh, finish up on that one? Yeah, this is a really fun topic. Um, give me some sense if I'm coming across loud and clear because uh, sometimes I never know. All right, thanks, Cliff. Um, yeah, because you you look at go to Port Canaveral. If you work at Port Canaveral, you've got awesome opportunities to go grab a bite to eat, right? They've got beautiful restaurants. It's a fantastic you know, shop. You got all the, the, the things you need right there at your fingertip. Go to Melbourne Airport. You've got all kinds of opportunities right there. Go to the spaceport. Your closest restaurant is about a 30 minute drive. Why? Because this domain was built by the federal government and they really didn't think about what was happening outside the gates. Why should they? Their job is to go launch for national security and go launch for exploration. So the kind of thinking, as I look at this as, a, and I'm not a planner, but I watch planners and they're brilliant people. A planner says, what's that future gonna look like and how am I gonna meet that need? And the communities come alongside that future requirement. So as I look at the population that's gonna be doing this work over the next 20, 30 years, the, right now they're in their 20s and they come to near the spaceport and they say, hey, where's all the life? There isn't a whole lot of life. So I think we have a tremendous opportunity in the spaceport in collaboration with our other modal partners and the, more importantly, the communities to put together a planning effort that understands the needs of that generation that's going to feed the next space growth enterprise. And how do we as a community have that conversation? Transportation is going to be part of it, but it's going to be a whole lot bigger than that. And there's a tremendous opportunity in that front. Just in a micro example, at Exploration Park, which is a small patch of land right outside the, the land of KSC, it's actually KSC land, Space Florida manages it. A few years ago, there were 200 people in that 60, 100 acre parcel. Right now, we're about 1,000, 1,500, and in the next year or two, we'll be at 2,000. Still no restaurants nearby. So all of the support kind of tools that you have, would no, the industry would normally kind of come up with because you've got a load and a demand, it's not there yet. And it's a fascinating dynamic to watch play out. So that's just my two cents from a non-planner's perspective on an opportunity to plan to make quality of life part of what we do to make this place attractive. We got Very you. Good, Mark. Hey, fresh fish you can handle. Just come to Port Canal. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that was a really good one. Yes, we have a lot more to, to discuss on that one uh, for the future. All right, so we are uh, getting down to the last few. Um, this one will be for Mark. Will the Kennedy Space Center be including any exhibits from some of the corporate partnerships that have been happening, such as SpaceX? That's a great question. Um, the Delaware North, I'm sorry, the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center, which is currently run by a company called Delaware North Corporation, they have done a fantastic job reaching out to industry and asking them to participate and telling the story of what's happening on the spaceport. And there is a, if there isn't a Falcon 9 there now, there will be one soon. We are, so there is a tremendous good dialogue on that front. And the Visitor Center is the place to go see it. Very good, excellent. All right, now let's see. Um, okay, Mark, you when you mentioned 20 SpaceX launches, 15 successful landings, what happened to the other five? The other five. <laughs> I love it, people pay attention to the details. Uh, those five were actually disposed of, they didn't need them. Um, in order to land a rocket, you have to store enough gas and liquid oxygen, so you can bring the thing back down and land it safely. Sometimes you have a payload that is so heavy and so important that the customers willing to write a check to say, go ahead and throw that one away because that's the only way we're gonna be able to get to orbit is to use every ounce of gas you have left in your fuel tanks. So those five um, were, were, were not necessarily used. I actually think they had one that might've landed on the barge and fallen off the side, um, maybe one of them, but. That's it's a great question. That's fun. All right. So we do have a question. Uh, what is the status of the Ellis Road uh, widening project? Um, and Cliff, you could feel free to to chime in here. Um, the the Brevard County uh, has the Ellis Road widening in the design phase. They are approaching 90% des design plans. 
and um, the right-of-way is programmed, uh, the right-of-way acquisition funding is programmed over a five-year period um, out to 2025, I believe. Unfortunately, we do not have construction funding in the DOT work program. And so our goal, uh, we have our sights set on uh, advancing the right-of-way acquisition as quickly as we can and funding the construction uh, in the fifth year of the work program. So it is challenging. Um, Ellis Road, um, as Cliff said, is a CIS facility, strategic intermodal system facility, and it is extremely critical uh, corridor. And, you know, having a an airport of that magnitude needs a better circulation system. It is critically important. And so it is the number one priority, and we're going to keep going until we get it done. So uh, that is the current status of that project right now. Um, I believe that is all of the questions. Um, Kristen, have I missed something? I have looked through and I believe we have the majority of the questions. Yeah, I think that kind of covers it. So I will say to everyone, if you think of any questions, um, after you, the session is over, you can send those to us. We can get those to your uh, to the presenters. Um, if we did somehow miss your question, we will go through the the question section, and I'll be sure to follow up with anyone after that. Yes, and you know, I just want to say that uh, thank you all so very much for joining us. Um, and again, if we didn't get to your question, we will certainly follow up uh, with it and get you the answer. Yeah, um, we, I'm sorry to interrupt Georgiana, but yes. we did have one more question come in. Okay. Um, so it, uh, does the Orlando Melbourne Airport have an issue with um, OS slash OW cargo? And I'll let you kind of, um, I'm not sure who should answer that one. Um, I'm, not sure, you. I'm not sure what they're asking me exactly. OS, o, what cargo? Uh, OS slash OW. Um, they, they didn't uh, provide a Oversized, oversized or overweight? Oversized, oversized overweight. overweight. Okay. okay. So, so that would, okay, that's a good question. Um, that would refer to uh, kind of our infrastructure, right? Our, our uh, condition of our runway, our length of our runway, uh, things like that. Uh, the short answer to that is no, uh, it, it doesn't. In fact, uh, you know, our, our runway is 10,181 feet long by 150 feet wide. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's long enough to, um, you know, handle takeoffs and landings of the world's largest plane. In fact, it's been here. The Ansadoff 2, what is it, the 225, has been here uh, several times to pick up cargo, aerospace cargo. Um, we recently had a um, rehabilitation uh, project with, with our main runway, which uh, included uh, the installation of a keel section in the in the middle section of the runway. The entire thing was overlaid, but. Uh, we've we've got like a nine or eleven inch keel section that uh, you know can handle a tremendous amount of weight. So um, no, uh, our run our our airport's open for oversized uh, uh, and overweight cargo. If I could just highlight that we have evaluated um, barge movements from Port Canaveral to the airport to that area. Keep in mind that the ICW goes right by US one, goes right by the airport, drafts twelve feet. Uh, the loft system out of Canaveral is 90 feet wide by 600 foot long. It was actually made for aerospace cargo for the uh, the, the Saturn boosters. So uh, we have contemplated that in previous years, working in conjunction with the airport. And there are certainly opportunities there as well. Cargo, large fuselage cargo coming in through the port on a barge uh, easily could be transit made made to be transited down to the airport. Thought I'd throw that throw that in there. And they, this, um, this same person sent just kind of a follow-up. Um, how about accessing the airport on the road system? Specifically cargo accessing the airport on the road system? Is that the question? Yeah, I think they're referring to the oversized, overweight cargo um, accessing the airport on the road system. Well, you know, I, I think it depends on, on the cargo, uh, like like uh, the other panelists mentioned earlier, you know, fuselages, things that are high, you, you run into signalized intersections that uh, there's, I can tell you there's 27 signalized intersections between this airport 
in, in I-95 if you take 192. So there's only about five right now um, if you take the Ellis Road uh, CIS corridor. So uh, we, we want to maintain that, enhance that, improve that. So yeah, there are, there are, there are certainly some, uh, you know, height restrictions and things uh, associated with getting in and out of a place like this airport. Okay, I one last question. Um, Mark, when looking at the different, and actually this could be Cliff as well, the different updates for both space and air travel, uh, someone is curious about the safety of both being conducted at the same time sharing the sky per se. So is there a safety plan in place? That is a great question. Um, the FAA governs both the airspace and the authority to transit the airspace with a rocket and will give the final go to launch. So the Air Force has been doing this for many years uh, the F in concert with the FAA. Very simply, we clear all the airspace so that a rocket can fly through. And, and we have gotten better and better over the years, the years at kind of narrowing the space the rocket needs to fly through so we can see more airspace open. open. And then, um, you know, there's always that risk when modes are in conflict with each other. You can imagine a drawbridge is an example of a, a boat and a car. I'm sorry, your, market, your uh, audio is kind of degrading just a little bit there. All right, reset again. Perfect. So Perfect. What, you, what you can see is there's always that challenge between modes, but there's ways to work that out. The FAA has a very robust process for that safety effort. You will never put an airplane in the same airspace as a rocket is flying. And those two very, very closely communicate. Very good. Very well, good. Well, uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you, uh, all three of you, for uh, uh, pr your participation uh, in this uh, meeting. Uh, I received a wealth of information, and I'm sure that everyone else ha has as well. I also want to thank our DOT partners. Um, they always do an excellent job in putting these type of events together and, and just sharing information. And so thank you all so very much. If there is another question, any more questions that come in, we will certainly follow up and get those emailed out to you. Um, just please complete the feedback survey. That'll be important uh, as we uh, do these in the future, and it's also important for DOT. Uh, so we would appreciate you filling out the feedback survey. So any last remarks? Uh, we do have just a few minutes left from our panelists. Otherwise. Uh, to again, thank you, Georgiana, for uh, moderating the event. You did a stellar job. Thank all of the participants for very interesting questions. Uh, I really like this online forum, and I think my colleagues would probably agree that it's, it's fun to get out here and talk and educate about what we have going on in our various um, organizations and how they all work together. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you to FDOT District 5, Space Coast, TPO, and the Central Florida Transportation Planning Group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well said, Bill. And uh, just, I just want to say, you know, it's been an honor for me to, to be here today uh, with all of you. So thank you very much for that. All right. Well, thank you all. Well, thank you have you. a good rest of the day. <laughs> thank you, everybody.